this panel will reflect on efforts in Holyoke to support community-driven revitalization with a focus on the challenge of warding off gentrification and the development of creative placekeeping projects to make spaces of belonging for the Puerto Rican community in Holyoke. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's been a long week for me, so um, just... Uh, give me a little grace. Um, mi nombre es Maria Salgado Cartagena, um, and uh, I actually was just in, the, in our little group. I was thinking about like my role, and really like I'm a hybrid um, between community folks and the institutions. Um, I also want to acknowledge a couple things: is that this work of community engagement. Um, has been happening since some of the pioneers. So I want to uh, really mention the pioneers um, doing this work in the 90s, um, including my friend Irma Medina, who um, uh, did early, early work with the campuses around the Puerto Rican Studies um, seminar. Um, Janeta Candelario, who I have always said, um, uh, she is the uh, theorist, and I'm the storyteller. So our work complements each other, um, and w and has some of the best practices when it comes to community-based learning. Um, she puts folks think that this kind of work is easy. It's a lot of labor um, to do it right, to do to have good partnerships with community, um, and so I think that I'm sort of a hybrid. Uh, I'll just tell a little story about Carlos um, and Betty, who were my role models in Holyoke, um, and my own mother. Um, that I just remember one, sem one semester we were supposed to have a bus tour for a campus, and I, might, I must have been like 25 at the time. I won't tell you how old I am now. Um, and uh, Carlos came up to me and said, Maria, can you do this tour? Because I just don't feel well. And I, and I was like, I used to call him jefe. I was like, jefe, I can't do that. There's like all these smart students coming here. Like, I'm the girl from South, South Holyoke. Like, he's like, Maria, you have intellectual knowledge that these students pay, organic intellectual knowledge that these students pay thousands of dollars to get. And that was the imprint forever. Um, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about our partnership. Um, and really, uh, oh, and Vanessa, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> I'll say a few words and then hand it back to Maria. I just I wanted to also just acknowledge a few um, folks um, before we um, uh, offer some comments and reflections today. Um, the first person is is that uh, is Antonio um, Martinez, who is no longer with us. And just to um, say that I, that's was my or the person who really introduced me to this work um, here in Western Massachusetts. And I started working with Antonio um, in the spring of 2016 when he asked me to come on and be his partner for a really um, big project in Holyoke, where I had the pleasure of working with um, Joseph and Joel who is somewhere out here, um, and uh, was really just an opportunity to start to build some relationships um, in the area. And um, I just learned so much from Antonio and the way that he did this work. And I just um, really want to acknowledge him and also say that, you know, um, uh, part of, I think, what uh, Antonio and many of us struggled with is the way that these institutions that we work in don't acknowledge and value the work that we do in communities. Um, and how much labor it is and that Antonio really was just such a model and letting youth lead and us to kind of step back and get in line. So I just want to um, give a big shout out to Antonio. Um, the other people I want to acknowledge are, of course, Maria, who is like family to me and um, just doing this work together. Um, uh, this is the first project that we really worked on together, but I would say the majority of the time that we spend is reflecting on kind of the questions of the symposium today, which would are the challenges of really doing this work and how we can um, just be, be better at it. Um, other people in the room I'd like to acknowledge are um, Evelyn, Josie, Miriam, um, Irma, Vanessa, Nelson, um, Luke is not here today from Holyoke High School, Dana and Betty is being just <laughs> real um, leaders in doing this 
work. And again, I just learned so much from all of you and just sharing a space with you. I, I just, um, I'm incredibly humbled to be on a panel when I feel like y'all like just have really um, taught me so much. Um, and of course, um, Joseph, Mari, Sonia Nieto, and Janetta, who, um, when I first arrived here, sent me her 20-page syllabus. <laughs> um, and I was like, um, I can never do that. So thank you, Janetta, because you have just shared so much um, with me, and I've learned so much from you in these conversations. And just really, I, I bow down. So thank you. Um, a few other things I'd just like to say that maybe will um, set the context for my reflections today is also acknowledging my, um, how much I've learned from my students in doing this work together because it is not easy and their patience and um, just kind of openness to doing this and thinking differently about what it means to be in college and to be learners from the folks that we're working with in community and to again step back and get out of the way and really um, listen because we have so much um, to learn to really kind of challenge as Madi opened but, um, opened with her comments today of thinking about how we understand what is knowledge and knowledge production. Um, so I teach Latino Latino studies at Mount Holyoke um, and my kind of background um, expertise is in urban studies broadly thinking about gentrification and revitalization with a focus on housing and um, housing politics, particularly public housing. Um, in the spring, this upcoming spring, I'm actually teaching a class based on Madi and Joseph's book called Latinx Studies um, in Action, and just really want to acknowledge them for um, organizing this today as well. Um, one of the reasons I, when I first moved here and Antonio asked me to um, start doing this work together, I was really reluctant because I was just doing a postdoc and um, didn't think that I was um, staying for the long haul. And I want to acknowledge that as being one of the challenges of how many faculty who are really invested in this work who come in and, and you know, want to be committed and be long-term community partners, but because of their um, uh, uh, positions within the academy that are um, often really um, uh, challenging because of the neoliberal um, university system that that work, that it's just hard to do, frankly. Um, so I think that's all I'll say now, and I'll turn it over to Maria as we start to talk about um, our project that we've done together. So as many of you know, the city of Holyoke is about to become the cannabis mecca of the world. Um, and so with that said, uh, for some of us, uh, and particularly me, it's um, I am damned if uh, our history as Puerto Ricans in the city of Holyoke gets erased. Um, and so... And so with that said, um, I was really concerned about gentrification um, and ways in which, in fact, to be, if I can be honest, um, and folks can handle it. Speak your truth, Mama. <laughs> uh, the gentrification that's happening in Holyoke is a result of five colleges. Um, it's junior faculty, it's students being able to obtain more affordable housing that they have in Northampton and, and in Amherst. Um, and so with that said, um, I just remember once walking or going to San Juan Bakery and I saw, no offense, two white girls jogging on High Street, downtown Holyoke. <laughs> and then a couple weeks later, I see a white man jogging with no t-shirt on Main Street in Holyoke. And I immediately said, these are the signs of gentrification. My 15 year old daughter at the time said, since when do white people jog in the downtown city of Holyoke? Of course she's my daughter. <laughs> and that really just started sort of this like feeling like I gotta catch up. And I, um, I had been at Mount Holyoke one night when Professor uh, Vanessa Rosa was talking about Canada and gentrification in an area where she had been doing her research. And I just thought, I need this woman on this team. Mm -hmm. Like, I've got to figure this out. I need the resources of the institutions to help us as community members figure out how do we identify gentrification? What is it that's happening beyond the white guy jogging on Main Street? Um, 
Uh, and so I had a conversation. We had met briefly. Uh, of course, we're connected to a lot of mutual folks. And, um, and, but hearing her talk on gentrification in Canada, it, I literally, I remember being in the audience and saying, are you talking about Canada or are you talking about Holyoke? Because the similarities were so, so parallel. And so um, I approached her. At the time, I was on the board of Nueva Esperanza. I am no longer on the board. Um, but I said, I, and we had just hired Nelson as an interim executive director. And I said, this is the work that Nueva did. Like, this is the work that Nueva did. South Holyoke was revitalized as a result of fires for hire, which we just marked uh, uh, yesterday, um, post-Hurricane Maria anniversary. Uh, we did a march in Holyoke to commemorate that same moment of the fires for hire. Um, and uh, Nueva Esperanza was born as a result of that to actually create safe and affordable housing in South Holyoke in particular. Um, so as the board member, um, not just the board member, I was the president, by the way. Um, <laughs> I just remember saying to Nelson, we've got to address this. Something's going to happen. Our history is going to be erased. And I approached Vanessa, um, knowing that she had been teaching these um, courses. And, that, uh, and so we, she was able to identify a student, and she'll talk about that process. Um, but really, that was the beginning of sort of this partnership. Um, I, when I say I'm a hybrid of, I, my paid job is I work at Hampshire College as the um, program coordinator for the Community Partnerships and Social Change Office. No, duh, no wonder I'm in that office. Um, but uh, we, so we do work with students as well and we do community engagement. Um, but I always tell folks uh, that's my paid job. It pays it barely pays my bills, um, just speaking truth. Um, but my passion is activism. I am an activist in the womb of my mother. Um, and, um, and so uh, I still have my feet in Holyoke. I still do a lot of activism in the city of Holyoke, even though I'm not connected to nonprofits. Which, by the way, let, just a side note, just because you all are working with partners and you're working with um, community organizations, that's not necessarily saying that you're working with the people. There's a whole lot of other structural class stuff around community organizations, right? So I'm just saying. So when people ask me, who are you working with? I'm like, I'm working with myself as a community activist. Um, so, that was just a side note. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, so we talked, um, and then uh, Nelson was on board at the time. Um, still on board, sorry, didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> um, Nelson was on, at the time we sort of developed like a plan to talk about gentrification, and I'm going to give it all over to you. Thanks, Maria. So um, after Maria approached me, um, I identified a student who has interest in um, critical housing studies. Um, her name is Issa Zulaga from um, Mount Holyoke. And um, when Maria first came to me, we had originally talked about this doing a project with my class called Mi Casa is Not Su Casa, Latinos and Housing. Um, I didn't come up with that name. David Hernandez did, so I had to acknowledge him. But it's good. <laughs> um, and um, but we had already I had already started a partnership with Springfield No One Leaves where we were doing a large-scale project on the receivership um, policy in Springfield so I knew that there couldn't we couldn't do anything with the class, but the student wanted an opportunity um, to um, gain some kind of research, research skills and was really interested in gentrification um, and so I also acknowledged to them that I wouldn't be able to take that on because of my own commitment. So I had to be really honest and kind of transparent about what my own limitations were, that I would supervise the student, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't be the one kind of driving so, uh, the project. So we met, the four of us met, Nelson, Maria, Issa, and myself. And, and one of the first questions we asked is, what do you want to know? Um, 
and they kind of outlined some of their questions and I pushed back on some of them. We had a really honest and transparent um, kind of conversation around what was possible and the amount of time that we had, which I think was core to our relationship and really kind of set the tone for moving forward. So um, key to that is that Nelson and Maria set the research agenda and they asked the research questions. So it wasn't, so I didn't go into Holyoke and say, well, I wanna do this project. Um, and that's something I've learned from the past. I've definitely made mistakes along the way. Um, so uh, I think we're kind of always learning and doing this work. Um, so I think that that was really important. So they set the research questions for Isa, and then Isa spent the semester doing the work. And I just wanna um, acknowledge her today. She couldn't be here. We did ask her to come, she couldn't attend. Um, and today we're not gonna be talking about any of the findings because we wanna obviously present that to the community first. So we're going to be doing as um, something that they asked for, Maria and Nelson, was that they wanted um, a series of workshops in Holyoke presented to the community. Um, and so that's something that we're going to be doing this fall. So keep your eye out on that or for that. Um, we're excited about, about that. So there will be a series of four workshops this fall that um, Isa and um, Maria and Nelson will really be coordinating. So very much um, uh, community driven with the idea of leveraging the resources of the five colleges um, to kind of support the needs. And one of the other things that we talked about in our first meeting and that I said to, to Nelson and Maria was, well, you know, we'd really like the community to obviously be involved in some way. So to really think about this as being the first phase of the research, but then having um, uh, the community kind of obviously take over the project as being key, but they did have a very specific kind of research need, um, and so we just wanted to respond to that um, right away. Um, Can I just say that the um, one thing you pushed back on was um, you can't really tell gentrification by a white guy without a shirt jogging on Main Street. I did say that to Maria. <laughs> There's something, and what Issa found is how do you track this? So what she did was identify the variables of neighborhood change, and one of the, that is not one of them. So it's the thing, you got to be honest, not yet. Yeah, maybe we'll add it into the formula. So, um, so now we'll talk about um, kind of five um, key things that were really important to our relationship in working together. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, one of the things that was really important was trust. And I don't know if you learned this from Jonathan or Janetta or any of your other mentors, but um, again, because I'm this hybrid, uh, in fact, in our back table, I was saying that um, if I had $5 for every time a student, a faculty member, uh, a staff of the five colleges, interviewed me, wrote a paper on me, used my language, used my knowledge, I would own a home on the hill. And yet, of all the years that I've done this work, I think I've received two papers back um, mm -hmm. that said, here's what I did, can you just look at it? And I'd say, no, I don't have that kind of commitment, but I can read the parts that you wrote about me <laughs> and give you feedback. Um, and so, I, for me, it was really important that I knew that I was going to work with a professor that was going to hold her students accountable. Professors, hold your students accountable. And who I knew I was going to receive something. That there was going to be some information, some paper, some numbers that I could then draw from. Um, and that's why... Uh, I had the conversation because I just knew that based on our relationship um, that there was a mutual trust. Um, I think I'm, I want to speak for you. Um, that there was a mutual trust and so I knew that um, Vanessa would make sure that the student produced the work that we were asking for. Um, something else we wanted to talk about, and I think I mentioned this in my comments before, was that it was really driven by Nelson and Maria that they set the research agenda. Um, we brainstormed together. We set a timeline um, and really made sure that we weren't the ones kind of um, uh, being the drivers behind the, the project, that it was, it was what y'all wanted, mm -hmm. um, and to, to just make sure that we were kind of meeting those expectations, which then leads to my next um, point, is that one of the big challenges in this project, um, and this came up in our group too, is the, that we're on a college or university schedule. 
And so we frankly ran out of time in the fall. Um, there was so much work that needed to be done and Nelson and Maria were so flexible. I felt like I was emailing them constantly saying, sorry, we need more time, we need more time. And Nelson, what's your, what was your line to me constantly of, about just willing to be patient? Every email he'd send back of saying, no, like, don't worry, we're, we're willing to wait. Um, and so here we are a year later, um, and now we have, I think, a really great project and something we're excited to um, present, but um, Central was being kind of transparent and honest um, about um, what was kind of happening. So Madi says our time's up, but can we say two more th yes. think quick things? <laughs> Do you I mean, if um, I, just in closing, I will say that um, in our group, and I know we're going to uh, talk about them, but one of the things that came up in our group is um, reciprocity in this work is super important uh, and one way that as a community partner I see that is that um, we need to be visible in your research not just quoted we need to be co-authors we need to be co-publishers we need to uh, our name has to be there with your name um, and I think the last thing I will say is our, a lot of stu folks who work with youth, um, we were just talking about transportation issues from the campuses to Holyoke to Springfield, but that needs to go both ways. Mm -hmm. Our students need to be on these campuses. Amen. Our students need to see professors of color. I, our students need to see that they can be here and they can be learners and they can be scholars. So I will just close with that. I think something else we just um, wanted to highlight as we wrap up our comments is to really think about the power dynamics that Maria um, highlighted and the kind of elitism of the academy and what it means um, to have these types of relationships um, and to think kind of carefully about how we navigate them with each other. Um, and um, the ways that, I, uh, in particular, the five colleges kind of use, uses Holyoke as this learning um, environment, but again, that these relationships aren't reciprocal. And then finally is um, something to keep in mind is the ways that as academics we need to kind of, again, get out of the way and get in line because really it's um, the communities that we should be thinking about as being knowledge producers um, and that we really just have so much to kind of um, learn but that we need to be um, better at leveraging the resources of these institutions. Our next two presenters uh, are Nelson, Rafael, Roman, and Joseph Kropczynski. So I want to start um, by just taking a moment to acknowledge this badass woman to my left. <laughs> if she is an activist in her mother's womb, uh, I'm an activist in her true embrace. Maria holds me in line. She calls me out if she has to call me out. Uh, she, we always have to see each other's face if we don't see each other for a long time. But it, she's, yeah, she saca la chocolate all the time down the stairs. Um, <laughs> But in this work, uh, in this new world that I'm exploring as executive director of something, when the community gaslit me, when nobody stood with me, uh, Maria was there. Uh, and so I just want to publicly say thank you, because I don't think you get thanked enough from the young men of color who are coming up. So I just want to thank you personally, Maria, for everything you've done for me. Um, and we're specifically talking about space um, and how badass Maria is at Hampshire in helping me when I came into the role as Nueva ED. She stuck her neck out there. She got me the interim job. She fought for me. And she put the institution's resources where her mouth was. You know, The very first summer, Cora Siegel and Frankie were my first two interns ever. And Cora, I still am using the fun development list that she created. Um, and then I got to really work with badass Joe Kopinski and Mari um, around this work. And it leads and it ties into all this anti-gentrification work. Um, and when I came to Nueva from the streets, stuff in the hood hasn't changed, whether it was Obama or Clinton or Bush and when I was staying in the street, nothing has really changed. It all feels the same to us. And so I'm coming from that community and world saying, listen, Nueva almost lost it all. In 2015, when we try to convene, I tell everyone it's my biggest political failure that I've ever had. I try to convene all the Latinos in one room and say, let's come up with an agenda with no focus, with no like being on the same political analysis. And it failed and blew up in my face miserably. I'll acknowledge that. 
And, and yet at the same time, we heard that Nueva was going to be sold. It was going to be given away to like the arch nemesis. I'm a Jedi fan. Nueva is called New Hope. That's what it means. It's the Jedi temple. And we were going to be sold off to the Dark Lord of the Sith who drinks out of a Ronald Reagan mug. And, and, and I was like, where do we go from here? And it was people like Maria and Darlene. I'll never forget that meeting. And Maria said, hell no. I'll chain myself to the front of those doors, but I'll be damned if this building goes to somebody else. It belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to him. It belongs to the people. And so that was the foundation from which I started. And it was Maria, under her leadership in the board, that they came out with our new badass mission and vision statement. So Nueva now exists to be a partner and a catalyst for a vibrant, powerful, sustainable Puerto Rican, Afro-Caribbean community of Holyoke. That's our mission. That's the work that we do. And so with that context, and the reason why I'm here today is talk about the Corazon Project and why we're doing it, exactly what Vanessa and Maria were saying is true. I'm a city councilor. I fight with the city every day to say that gentrification's happening. And they say, prove it, Nelson. What we're doing as a city is that the low to moderate income percentage cap is at its max in the city of Holyoke. What we are doing is increasing and diversifying the middle income stock of the city of Holyoke. So percentage-wise, low to moderate income's at its capacity. But it hasn't been renovated since Carlos Vega did the work. Right, since Maria and all of them did the work to renovate these properties. So we're living in 70s and 80s conditioned low to moderate income housing. And guess what? Fires are happening again in Holyoke. We had the New Year's Day fire. I had a Main Street fire. And guess what happens when those buildings burn down? One of these new property developers buy it up and up goes a duplex home. So on the Northeast Street fire, those were almost 53 units. I used to live at 106 Northeast Street. Yoli came to my house for the first fundraiser for the mayor at the time. And that whole building's gone. They're going to build a duplex on that from 53 units to two duplex units, we're not replacing them. Ray Street, I call it Gentrification Row. And I know many of you have frequented there. If you notice, look at the people of color who go to that space. Not many of us. We don't go, we don't put our dollars there, we don't support there because they don't include our community. When we ask what percentage of people work here, oh, 53%, but they're all in the kitchen or in the back. They're not in the front, they're not on the front lines. And so we're seeing 100% of Ray Street is sold to people who don't live in the city of Holyoke. So on Main Street, we're saying we're a block away we don't feel welcomed. And so when I first came into office at Nueva, me, Maria, the community, I say we because we pushed for it. We got past my very first day in office, and I think Josie Valentin, she's the badass lesbian who, why I ran. Where's Josie? She's still here? Hi, hey, Josie. Yes. Give Josie a round of applause. Um, thank you, Josie, for uh, paving the way for being a Latinx rebel in the council. We pushed and we got the Puerto Rican Cultural District passed the very first day in the city of Holyoke, very first day. And we said, but how are we physically, visibly present and visible? And Maria's, and I told you, she, I'm an activist in her true embrace. She's the one that always calls out, why is it that every year for the St. Patrick's Day parade we paint shamrocks and they stay 365, and yet we can't even paint a goddamn coqui on the street to claim our space, right? That's Maria talking. Um, and so we said very publicly when I got into office, I want to just put up banners on every light pole on Main Street to just say, welcome to the Puerto Rican Cultural District. And I'm crazy. I started calling Seat Town and Goya, and I don't care who it is. Can you give me some money to do this? I contacted a company in Connecticut, and I went to Marcos Marero's office, because in our city, we do have the chief economic development officer is a Boricua, and I challenge him all the time. He knows I'm his biggest friend and his biggest headache. When I call his office, it's either for a complaint or for a moment of, yeah, great job. And so Marcos said, Nelson, why are you going to do this when there's this National Endowment of the Arts grant and Joe Kapinski CDE, we just got this money to re revitalize under 391, the 391 underpass. And I remember seeing the initial sketches that I called Joseph, because Joseph and I go back, and it said, like, Art Park. I said, Joseph, if that's not called Coqui Park, Mark Anthony Park, <laughs> Celia Cruz Park, I'm a protest. I'm a be Joseph said, calm down, calm down, brother. <laughs> Joseph's always my comic. Calm down, calm down. To calm down, Nelson. Calm down. Talk, talk to me. But come to my office. Come meet. And I did. And he said, Nelson, why don't we just blend them? Like, and so we went back to Marcos. And Joe, and I have to give Karen credit. Karen, thank you for being a badass white woman who gets it in the institutional world. Thank you, Karen. Um, yes, give her a great snap. She's badass. They resubmitted their NEA plan to now create El Corazon Project. And that came from an advisory group from the neighborhood. And it's people, it's places, it's the homeless men who are in the Providence Ministry shelters, it's us from the street. Like Maria said, it's the people. What we changed the narrative and the shift, and I thank Joseph and Karen on it with this grant, is I love you institutions, but stop it with the goddamn focus groups with 10 people at a time. That's not really our people. You're not talking to nobody. And I see the reports. We did four focus groups. 10 people came. It's the same usual suspects. When I look at that list of who signed in, it's all of us. It's like all of us going to the same meetings. 
Joseph in the city got it. They contracted Nueva Esperanza, right? And we could use that capacity money. I'm a staff of three. I'm at 30 hours a week at $30,000, and I have to raise 50000 every year, minimum. That's open. The board did that. So I'm raising my money to be there because I believe in Nueva, right? The city gave us a $15,000 contract. And I hired organizers from the street to go out and do surveys. So Gustavo from One Holyoke, Carmen Ocasio from the Neighborhood Association. We hired a church organizer, and we hired someone to go to the businesses and nonprofits. And we did over 150 surveys, and Joseph's going to go over that. But we went door knocking. We went back grassroots. We went out to the community. We listened. We talked to people. We only put up the online survey two days before just to see if anybody else wanted to participate, OK? Just because you have to be fair. But it's really our community that always gets left out. But when it comes to the space now, not only do we get that NEA grant, which we're going to go very publicly, so I expect you all to please donate because the banners are coming and Joseph's going to show you some of that stuff. But we really took the time to really embed all of that in Nueva's programming. So these two spaces you see here, that mural to the left was on a handball wall at Susi Park. And our Julio Social Justice kids, I'm going to play two minutes of what they've been learning. They painted that with a collective of Puerto Rican mural artists from Puerto Rico, women, called More Vivir. And the kids, through our indigenous circle leadership process, self-selected three of their own peers' faces to appear on the murals. So those are our kids. And that's in the handball wall. But that goes back to our history. Nueva painted murals in the community to create space, to prove that our ownership. And I know Denise is here. She used to work with our Acuidis kids. And they painted a mural that embedded the Puerto Rican and American flags. And what did a then city council do at the time? She came down in protest and said the Puerto Ricans were trying to take over. We have the newspaper articles, and we've submitted our archives to the Wisteriors. And then this, this mural to the left, this is Nueva's main building. This is our headquarters at 401 Main Street. You're all invited. That mural, the Colect More Vivir artist painted again with our youth before they left back to Puerto Rico. Okay, wait, I just have to yeah. put a little plug. The More Vivir, um, this, is what, this, is where I'm a, this is where I'm a hybrid. Hampshire College used our summer money, our summer grants, to get them to work with Nueva and the youth from, from Nueva. So I just have to put a little plug because I have this little other hat too. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to think, exactly, and even this fall, we are piloting now a fall Cuyo program on Saturdays, and Maria and her department again gave us Alex. They're amazing. They're fabulous. They're glitter nails. The kids love it. And, it's, and they're, they're teaching gender studies, right, and LGBT studies, which we love. And those partnerships are critical in allowing us to do the work. But think about if I didn't have those staff or be able to pay those two amazing women to do this work with our kids, right? And so that was done by our youth. And so we are now creating all this. And now we're a finalist because of this El Corazón project for a Bloomberg Foundation grant. We're one of 14 cities in the whole US, the only one in the Northeast, to possibly get this money. And it's a lot of that work and a lot of endless nights. And me going back with Joseph and Karen and poor them, every time I don't like something or I don't agree, like even the damn color of the Puerto Rican flag that might appear publicly, I'm like, uh-uh, that's dark blue. I don't like that. Nope. <laughs> they go back. Or Joseph's initial ones for the banners, I was like, ah, it doesn't say Puerto Rico, it doesn't look Puerto Rican. Joseph works endless nights, and he'll send it at 2, 3 in the morning, and then text me at 1 or 2 in the morning, can you send me more stuff? Joseph, coño, I'm sleeping, leave me alone. <laughs> and then, but that's the kind of partnership between institutions and, and the community that allow us to have and make our own space. And so in the next three years, you're going to come down to Holyoke, and Nueva's doing some badass stuff, so I encourage you to look us up online. We have a black box theater company. We're bringing a professional off-Broadway cast that's doing Magdalena Gomez's work, Dancing on My Cockroach Killers, October 12th through the 14th, $25 a ticket. We sold out last year when we brought La Gringa from Chicago's Urban Theater Company. We have a black box theater. We're opening our coffee shop. We have a cultural center now. Martin Espada is donating his library. We're going to have the Martin Espada Library in Nueva Esperanza, reference library. Come on down. And so we're trying to create this antithesis or this hub saying our community has space. And my vision is, because I'm really tied to Puerto Rican Cultural Center of Chicago, let's make Paseo Holyoke. Let's make a space that is calling out that's structurally ours. And I thank Joseph and Karen and Maria and Vanessa, because we are going to create a gentrification task force. And now every year, that's where your institutions could come in. With that base work that they did, we hope annually to produce a report following those metrics, looking at those categories that Vanessa and that amazing student Isa did to say every year we're going to come out with a report and we're going to track. We're going to share what's going on with gentrification in Holyoke. So when you tell me it's not happening, I have hard data every year that shows us that it's happening. But I need your help as institutions to do that research for us because I don't have that capacity. And even Janetta, I just pitched to her amazing students. But even think about, and I love Maria started this with Wilson Valentin and I was just sharing it at my table. I have my Elms College intern Javier here. He's a social work intern. 
And so he's doing and building 3D profiles for all of our tenants because we still own buildings. But Elms College is allowing me to take a free three credit course as a guy who doesn't have a degree to go there. And Maria, with Wilson and her department, paid for community activists to take the colonization in our own backyard course. So I got to take a ham I still got my Hampshire ID and my, car and my partner works there now, but I swear to God, I carry it with me because I don't have a degree. And I show it to my mom and my grandma because I get real proud every time. I swear to God, look, I got my Hampshire ID. They, they enrolled me in Hampshire College and I got to take that course for free. So you talk about equity and creating space for our communities. Challenge your departments to say, hey, if we're gonna go and do that work in Nueva, can we offer one or two spaces? I have a staff of three, none of us have our degree, right? And we're all doing this work. Imagine three credit courses, add up, add up, add up, and send those students to do their internships with us. I'm excited that Janetta students are now, some of them, one of them might take our work that Frankie and Cora did on our fund development, and they're now gonna help me continue that work. We need those spaces. So I'm gonna end there, I'm gonna play the two minute video, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Joseph. Just so you can get a flavor of gentrification and spaces are with young people and we're about still doing that work. So we're just gonna play the first two minutes so you can see some of these amazing kids. I am Brandy and I am Cuyo. Yo soy Isis Feliciano y yo soy Cuyo. My name is Janacy Rivera and I am Cuyo. I don't know. My name is Jonah Lise and I am Cuyo. Circle. Circle the, is where you ask questions to the to the owner or the counselor of of this this circle. Circle, you guys. Circle process to me is really special because I love to know where my kids are at. And especially when we come together at the beginning and just check in, that's really important. Um, we've sort of shied away from that part of life as a family. And so, I like that circle process will bring us together as a family to resolve issues, to resolve conflict, to just be open to express ourselves in a safe space. Um, so to me, circle is really important because it is providing that structure where kids can feel safe. Um, I fun, um, active. I've learned a lot and actually met a new family and community. Nice. Let's face it, there's just a lot of things that aren't right with the world and they hurt and they're harmful. And I wanna be able to teach skills uh, with my own people in my community on how to navigate through those systems. Um, my favorite workshops to have been a part of were Gus's workshops. They're very powerful and also build an awareness that kids didn't have around a lot of social issues um, that are even happening now today. And so I really appreciated him bringing his knowledge, um, especially since he is so relatable to our community. You know, he looks a lot like our kids and our kids can learn from that, which is really important. Uh, my favorite teaching, there's singing. So give it up for our Cuyo kids, aren't they amazing? And so you can go on Nueva's uh, YouTube page. We piloted this program, like I said, free of charge the first year. I paid for their field trips every Friday. Um, but Maria, like I said, if it wasn't for her original, Frankie taught them Vigigante masks. This year we had 30 youth, all from Holyoke, majority from Holyoke. We had a youth as far as Greenfield. One kid came up from Maryland to stay with his family to join the program. And we already have a waiting list of 54 youth. 
And so we can't do it without partnerships. And the kids sell all their artwork, and we teach them entrepreneurship. We teach them ownership of space, and we're telling them they are the next generation to take over and run Nueva. They're the ones that, and, and we got to take them to Hampshire, and some of them have never been on a ca campus before. One of the kids erased a math equation. We thought he erased like the cure to maybe something important, uh, <laughs> even though Maria and them told him not to. And he, they blew up a gummy bear. But they went to the Massachusetts Fine Arts Museum. They saw the Lion King. Some of these kids saw their first musical at the Bushnell. And so those are the critical steps of creating ownership. And by painting murals, being in the community, they're creating space. And Joseph is going to work with them for the Corazon Project. Thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the things just about, uh, you know, I'm, like I'm doing my academic thing. I take notes when people talk, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of things that are, that are being said here. And there's a lot of things that maybe are being unsaid too, you know, and I, and I think that when when we put together this uh, this this afternoon or this day, and and I thought about being on this panel, these are all people that I love, mm -hmm. right? So and and uh, you know, I think I was thinking about Marie Jose and talking about how love is so important to our practices, right? Uh, ac uh, as academics, you know, the love we have for our students, for our community partners, for for each other, and I think that aspect of it is really you know, important. I mean, there's other ways of expressing that in the way we, 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 we can talk about empathy and other things, but I think, you know, if you want to go, you want to go to the core, right, mm -hmm. you want to go to the heart, mm -hmm. the corazón, we have to talk about love. Mm -hmm. So I do think that I love all these folks, and I think that it's so exciting for me to be on the panel. And it's so strange to say that on campus, right? Yeah, right, like, can you right, say like that? Like on yeah. campus, you can't say, I love you, <laughs> right? And as someone uh, who straddles these two worlds, to be with a student, I, I really want, I'm like, I'm a hugger, can I hug you? But love is at the bottom of it. And for us on these institutions, yeah. like people look at us like we have three eyes or something. Right. Well, and in fact, we were having this conversation with, I was, I was talking to Katya at the, our staff meeting, right? And we talked about criticality. You know, mm -hmm. we, we want to bring a critical practice to our service learning, to our education, mm -hmm. to right. our research. And, and, you know, and Katya, who's always asking good questions, says, what does that mean? What does criticality mean? And for me, it includes love. Mm. You know, like love is a critical practice, mm -hmm. really, right? You know, and I think that's something that's really a kind of essential thing that, you know, maybe one takeaway from today is to understand that. So, like, I was writing, you know, like, we talked about decolonizing practices, right, in, in, in Nelson's bio. And, you know, love is a decolonizing practice mm -hmm. when you embody it with also a kind of, you know, the criticality that Vanessa brings to her research and the... The, the deep uh, knowing that both uh, Nelson and Maria bring to their work in Holio. So I think that, you know, because the other thing was about, we talk about new knowledge creation, right? So this is something that we talk about as academics. This is new knowledge creation right here. We're seeing it. This is what it's about. It's this, you know, this kind of idea that ways of speaking, ways of understanding spaces and places and ways of, and actions provide new practices. I mean, one of the things within the book, and, you know, Mari was really, uh, so important about this is seeing how uh, testimonials play a role in, in, the, in the kind of storytelling plays a role in how we kind of convey knowledge and, and bring knowledge to each other. So I just, and the idea of like trust and reciprocity, but you know, when I, you know, I was writing down all those notes, but I, you know, then I kept, then I wrote love because I knew that's what it was all about ultimately. And I, that, so that's how I wanted to frame my presence, you know, on this panel and with all these, you know, really fabulous people. So I'm going to do just something really quick, which is that we were, you know, talking about the Corazon project and you know, working with Karen on it for the last couple of months. I'm going to quickly start with a project I did with Karen called Arrivals, which is uh, in Holyoke at uh, Moshe Street underpass. And one of the kind of key characteristics of this work is how are people involved in the creation of spaces and places. So in this particular piece, it was a, a kind of uh, underpass in Holyoke, a very uh, dark space, uh, the call for art was to provide light. And then Karen and I recognizing the context that is next to the train station and that people arrived there, developed uh, a kind of a working process and uh, they don't, for, uh, for communicating and talking to people to get their um, arrival stories, right? To understand how um, those stories could be collected and then put upon, put along that wall and, and that they could be shared. And that those are, the stories are bilingual. The, some of the stories we got in Spanish because 
people spoke to us in Spanish. Other stories we, we got in English, but everything was translated, both to Spanish and English, because it's a bilingual city. And one of the things, you know, I think when, uh, once we put this up, and uh, the, uh, one of the things that was noted is that it's actually the first piece of public thing in Holyoke that's bilingual. Mm. Right? There's nothing in Holyoke that's bilingual that's official. You know, you have like stores and things, private places. There's no public infrastructure that's bilingual. It's amazing. You know, you have a city that's, a, that's really a bilingual city. So I think that was, uh, uh, you know, a really important part of, of, of thinking about this uh, work. And then Holyoke Visible, a uh, project I did with, with Max Page, but uh, with, which is to kind of create this uh, trailer, a, a, a trailer that's pulled by a bicycle and, uh, and uh, goes to different places in Holyoke. But the outside of the trailer, and here, this is where the relationship I have with Nelson gets revealed, because Nelson was the best critic of this project. Right? Because, and I think, you know, maybe because I'm trained as an architect, my, my, my understanding of critique is that it's part of the discourse. I mean, as long, you know, as long as it's respectful, as long as it's kind of reciprocal, and it is. But Nelson was, you know, the, one of the kind of primary critics of this project, and it became better and deeper because of that. So I think also that's another thing to kind of take away for work in, uh, in community settings is that we can have discussions. It's not about arguments. It's about differences, and we do. And how do we, and how do we begin to have those discussions, and how do they play out in the work? In this case, it made it a lot better. Because, you know, Nelson, as I said, this doesn't look like, this doesn't look like Holyoke. This doesn't look like Puerto Rican Holyoke. This is, you know, it's not. So, I, so what did we do? We set up a series of workshops for people to paint each of the slats that made the outside of the trailer. So there's a two inch by 24 inch slat, then a series of workshops. And the theme was making things visible in Holyoke because part of the conversations were there are a lot of things that are going on in Holyoke that they just need to be made visible. So we had on the left, you can see food, language, and culture. These were things that through our community meetings were determined to be the things that uh, could be made more visible. So, El Corazon. So the, and so as Nelson said, we we're, you know, we're work, started working on this project. He kind of did the outline of it. We're uh, right now finalists for a Bloomberg grant to get a lot of money. But essentially what this is, and this is, so this is a kind of my academic thinking part of it, is that I'm interested in, two minutes, that's okay. I'm interested in the way we can make spaces that are anti-gentrification spaces, right? Because we, you know, we can see the studies and we can know the consequences, but what can we literally do in the space to make the difference and kind of make a bulwark against gentrification. And one of the things is that have the community up there be reflected in the spaces that we make and do that in creative ways. So this is two towers. It's kind of a dark image, but it's two towers that are at the end by 391. They used to hold electrical lines. Uh, hg &E, we're going to take them down. Marcos Medero said, no, don't do that. We can, we can do something with them. So that's what we're going to do to them. Right? So we have these large-scale you know, bomba dances and lighting and you know, begin to, they become gateways to the new Main Street, to the new Puerto Rican cultural district that Nelson has shepherded through city council. This is the political dimension of it. Then how do we follow up on that with an architectural and a spatial dimension? And this is how we do it. So we have a street corner here right by Calle Social <coughs> Club. There's a, a guy who, the hot dog guy is there every week. That's part of the, the, the nature of it. So what do, what do we want to do? We want to make a kind of pavilion there that then supports people buying the hot dogs there and have a place to sit and eat it and converse and have conversation. So how do we build these kinds of spaces? You know, Nueva's building, right? Kind of classic Holyoke 19th century building. Woo! Now it's a 21st century Holyoke building. <laughs> and representing the local <laughs> things that are going on there. So, so these are the kinds of key things that, that uh, and I think it's about a kind of integrative approach because I'm, you know, I'm, uh, Karen and I work in the built environment realm. Nelson is in the kind of community and political realm. How do we collaborate? How do we make projects together that begin to, you know, uh, use our strengths to get to some of these very, like, wicked issues, like the issue of gentrification? So, there's, you know, there's so much of the kind of, like, neoliberalism and capitalism that are pushing gentrifying processes. So one way to do it is that make these spaces very much about the people who are there. And, and then uh, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. I think I'm done. Right? Yeah. <laughs>
know, there's so much to talk about, but I want to be respectful of the time because we want to make sure that, you know, we have a lunch workshop and so forth. And we also, again, the whole point is, is also to have dialogue and community um, building here. So first of all, again, can we give the panelists a big round of applause? They're such, our first one was amazing, our second one is amazing. So um, like the first session, we're going to have our panelists actually join the tables, um, and they're going to be separate, so they're not going to be all sitting together, but at separate tables. And the question that we want to ask is, you know, how can partnerships help build capacity for Latinx communities that respond to complex cultural, political, and economic conditions? So what kind of partnerships are you involved in um, that you can imagine could be developed um, that are needed, um, that can build capacity uh, for Latinx communities to respond to. Because again, it's not us responding to, but communities themselves responding to these questions that are related to cultural, political, and economic conditions. So again, we're gonna give folks um, just 10 minutes and the same process that we would love for you to put it on either on this wall or the other wall, those little stickies, they are super important for us. Um, so if you can uh, make sure you have a reporter who is jotting down what the response is in the conversation and dialogue, and we're going to have the panelists come in. And again, during lunchtime, there still will be time for dialogue and conversation and asking questions from our panelists as well. So one more round of applause and, and get to work.